is so nice to have you all here and be part of our community. Community is so important to us, especially as humanists. Anyway, Bruce and I were lucky enough to be able to afford to go to the AHA conference, the 77th AHA Con American Humanist Conference in Las Vegas. I don't have much faith and I don't have much confidence in the future, but it gave me renewed hope. And that's worth more than I can say because hope is something I need to have right around now in, in our country at this time. I have the program here. It talks a little bit about the bios of all the speakers. Please come and look at it if you want, if you want to. Um, I bought several books, one of which I'm reading to you today, and I'll tell you why. But this book is new. It's, we are very fortunate to have a human. Very fortunate. We have a new member who's looking at being coming one. I don't see her here today. Britt, are you here? I met her at the conference and she is planning on becoming one. We don't have a leader that tells us how that we have to thank a god or gods or fear a god or gods, but we do have the human need to have some celebrations with some things that go on in our lives. And this gives us some ideas about humanistic celebrations. So it's in our library and you're free to check it out or look at it. What's the title? It is the Humanist Ceremonies Handbook. Okay, one of the people that was there is a children's book writer. His name is J.R. Becker. He is a professor, of, he's a lawyer, and he has two children, and he wanted to tell them stories that are true. Um, in this state, since we are just looking at new science standards that take out the word evolution and put in the word creative design, I mean, this is topical to me, so I'm going to read this, and that's why our children are here today. A little bit more than a minute, but not too much longer. It is poetry, and it is the story of life for Annabelle and Aiden. Annabelle said, why do we look the way we do, with hands and feet in neat sort sets of two? What made my eyes, and what made my nose? and the shape of my body from my head to my toes. Finding those answers is much too, far too much work. Just say it was magic, said Aiden with a smirk. <laughs> Melt the owl. <laughs> the wise owl answered, then how will you learn? We live to discover, he said with concern. You'll be pleased to know that the answer you seek is quite magical itself, so please take a seat. I'll tell you the story of how it all came to pass, the structure of life from the birds to the grass. Once upon a time, from far and near, hung zillions of planets for billions of years. When in a dark little corner and a tiny blue dot deep under the ocean in a very special spot, a itty bitty thing woke up anew and came alive. I tell you, it's true. The first living thing that ever came to be, it looked all around, and what did it see? A beautiful world, earth, water, and stone. There was so much to share, but it was all alone. Blue skies and mountains, oceans without end, but to share this world, it needed a friend. So it pushed and it pushed and it managed to create a perfect copy of itself, a new friend and mate. And together they made more friends to be round, floating up through the oceans, crawling down on the ground. But when they copied themselves, though they tried best they could, some came out a bit different than the others often would. With slight random changes, few helpful, most not, tiny mouths or teeny fins, or eyes small as dots, those were helpful changes, 
could make babies of their own a lot more than the others who were more and more alone. So as much time went by, the animals would change into whatever sort of form their environment arranged. Corals and plants and sponges and spores, jellies and eels and fishes galore. Looking for more food they could find at hand, they began their journey from water onto land. Some mouths became beaks that could dig in the sand. Some fins became legs that could walk on the land. Lizards and snakes all crawled on the beach with mushrooms and plants and flowers and weeds. Spiders and butterflies all dancing around, celebrating their trip from water to ground. Some joined in the dance, but stayed close to the waters, like lizards and seals, frogs, turtles, and otters. Some became dinosaurs, then penguins and birds, aside mice, rats, and wolves, and small elephant herds. Some primates became apes, like funny chimpanzees, while others became people, like just like you and like you. And while we're all still evolving, evolving into what, we can't guess, can you imagine the ways we all might change next? But how do we know, Aiden asked with much doubt. That's my favorite question, one we can't do without. Well, besides all the fossils and our genes and DNA, our bodies tell the story with more clues than I can say. Whales still have leg bones from their time on the land. People still have tail bones and you can feel with your hands. Before you kids were born, you grew much like a fish still grows with eyes on the sides which merge to make a small little groove under your nose. You had slits that turned to gills and fish, but for you they formed your jaw and a tail that snakes and chimps still use to make sure they never fall. Our wisdom teeth and goosebumps from the way we wiggle our ears for just a few of the countless clues that tell us how we got here. Every living thing, people from every single race, their dogs, their cats and flowers, come from the same exact place. A young boy in Africa, the grass, bugs, and bees. Your teacher's par parrot, who speaks Cantonese. <laughs> we are all related, whether owl, boy, or girl. Even you and me and Aiden with the rest of the world. We all share the same story. So what does this mean? Just take a small look at our family tree. It reminds us to be kind and to treat each other well, that we are all connected and together we must dwell. This world belongs to all of us equally to share, to hold hands together as we breathe the same air. Okay, there are lots of little comments around the side that I didn't read that are interesting little facts. But this, along with two other books and a fourth book coming out, um, these are being donated to the children's room. They have been signed by the author. Okay. So, Thank you so much, Kathy. That was great. Good story. Good story. Ten out of ten. You know, five star rating on, on Amazon. <laughs> So that was our Humanist Minute, and if you'd like to have your own Humanist Minute, it's something that expresses humanism in a way that is personal to you, or you'd like to share with other people, that was a good example, I like that one. It was a little longer than a minute, but I think we enjoyed it, so we'll, we'll let that go. Anyway, uh, back to the other business. How was breakfast? Breakfast pretty good, huh? Yeah. Uh, thank you, our breakfast crew! If you'd like to help out, we come in probably around 8 o'clock in the morning. We start putting breakfast together. You can always use an extra set of hands if you're an early riser and you want to you know, get out of the house and do something. We'd always love to have you. Uh, we're good conversation. Just ignore you know, Pete. He's fine. <laughs> Kidding. Anyway, uh, so uh, we are a donor-funded organization, so we are your secular oasis here in the Valley. If you like what we do and you want to be a part of that future, please do. 
could use some donations. We just got the air conditioner replaced. Stuff costs money. So I think uh, this is a good model we could replicate. We're having other groups ask us about that. So humanism could uh, change the world, to quote my favorite guy, Bill Nye. Um, we have a box of books in the back. Uh, this is my last warning before it goes off to the donation um, center. So if you could look at the boxes of books in the back over by the bookshelf and uh, grab, take what you want, otherwise they're, they're gonna get donated. Uh, the stuff on the bookshelf, that's a dollar a book. So take a book. Uh, we also have Lost and Found also on the bookshelf. It's getting a little full. Uh, if you've lost something or you're looking for something new. Um, <laughs> There's a nice jacket in the back there. Yeah, we anyway, uh, so if you have a lot of something, please do take a look. Uh, we may just end up donating that to charity if it lasts too long. Uh, some of it's been there for quite some time. Uh, Vici, would you like to come up and uh, give your little spiel? Give my little spiel. 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 I want you to know how very responsive I am. Chris just asked for money. Um, <laughs> I like immediate gratification. <laughs> this is like the check outside of the grocery store. I have a very small check to donate today, and I'll explain to those who don't know what this is. I'm the designated realtor. So if anyone, if any humanist or anyone referred by a humanist uses me to buy or sell real estate, then I get 10% to HSGP. Um, this one's really small because it wasn't a house. It was dirt. <laughs> well, that was really expensive dirt. That's 10%. So I sell dirt, I sell houses. <laughs> Judy Wilbur had some land in Maricopa and asked me to sell it for her, so I did. Cool, That's thank it. you so much. Call thank me. you. Honestly, any, any little bit helps. I mean, you know, it doesn't matter if you think it's small or not. I mean, every dollar goes into this place. Your board is all volunteer. We don't take any money. It all goes into here. It all goes into new signs, fixing the place up, and making sure that we've got good food to eat. All that stuff keeps the place around. And we're proud to do it for you. So thanks so much. OK, um, I got an announcement from Christina. Do you want me to just read it? Yeah, you read it. All right, I'll, I'll go ahead. Uh, we actually had a guest. I'll give you some background. Um, we do, Christina does TED Talks uh, on Wednesday nights. We watch some TED Talks, and we discuss them. We have discussions about them. And uh, we had a guest come in uh, by the name of Ron Blake. He's in the back. You want to raise your hand, I guess? Or, uh. So Ron Blake, a uh, really cool guy. Uh, he's got a really cool project we'd like you to know about. So uh, Christina wrote me a little thingy to, to read here. Ron Blake has been going around the country collecting signatures to appear on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert. He's a survivor of sexual assault and PTSD. And due to a suicidal moment that was prevented thanks to The Late Show with Stephen Colbert and laughing at a joke, He's now attempting to get on by going around collecting signatures. So he's trying to get on the show, sorry. Uh, he's done a TEDx talk, and in fact, he was here on TED Talks. Um, hopefully, he'll be joining us for lunch. Yes, I put him on the spot. It worked. Um, so anyway, uh, if anybody else would like to go up and talk to him or sign his boards, so if you want to help him get on the Colbert Show, you want to sign his boards. How many are you up to now? Um, 381 of these giant boards, and 25,312 strangers I've met around the country wow. that I've just walked up to and engaged with. So uh, that's what I've done for 941 days full time. I, I meet strangers. Um, so so 25,000 plus signatures so far. If you'd like to contribute, help him get on the show, you can go in the back and uh, sign his posters at the end of the meeting. Good enough. And check out his TEDx talk. Check out the TEDx talk too. His name is Ron Blake. Ron Blake. Okay, uh, we have a couple other meeting announcements, and then we'll get to these through real quick here. We do have a Smart Recovery program. It meets every Monday, so tomorrow night, 7 p.m. If you're suffering, uh, or you know somebody who's suffering from some form of addiction, alcoholism, drugs, video <coughs> games, you name it, come on by. We'd love to have you. It's just a peer-to-peer -peer support group. Next, Philosophy Under the Influence is coming up June 17th. It's going to be a good one. Youth Pro Dilemma. That will be one of the criticisms, oh. but we're talking about divine command theory. Divine command theory. Is it just because God says so? Right. It's like a video game. So if you'd like to uh, have a little uh, 
have some alcohol, have a couple drinks, and discuss philosophy, which is, you know, the best state to discuss you know, worldly matters. <laughs> you know, so come on by. It's uh, Sunday, June 17th time. We've changed time. 5, 5 p.m. 5 p.m. Um, also, finally, last announcement for today. Sunday speaker, Joe Blankenship, is going to be our next Sunday speaker. Joe's our property director here. He's doing a great job. You here today, Joe? I think I saw you. Hey, Joe, thank you so much for getting the air conditioner fixed. Can we give a round of applause for Joe? Yeah. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks, Joe. Well, Joe is a super talented guy. He's, he cares so much about education and children. He's going to be giving a talk about the state of education here in Arizona next time. That's going to be on Sunday, June 24th, 9 a.m. for breakfast, 10 a.m. for the talk. Um, in this presentation, Joe compares the policies and outcomes of the school systems of Arizona and Massachusetts. Ooh. Ooh. Any, any spoilers there? Uh, yeah. <laughs> hey, we have money on this one. <laughs> uh, he will share with us which school systems, uh, sorry, which of the states value education and the level in which these states take responsibility for providing opportunity and hope for its children. So that's the end of our announcements. I'd like to invite Pam to come up and introduce our speaker. Thank you, Pam. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very excited about our speaker, and I think everyone here is today. And I want to give a big thank you to Miss Christina Hepler for reaching out to our speaker, Chris, and helping me to get in here and all the other great ideas you have. So, Christina, thank you. And if I can also say thank you to many of you who bring great ideas for speakers to me, and I promise you I'm following up on all of them and doing my best to bring your suggestions in for presentations. Let me tell you a little bit about our speaker today. We're hearing from Chris Shelton, and let me share with you that Chris Shelton is an author, professional YouTuber, public speaker, and formal, former cult member turned activist. He was part of the Church of Scientology and worked at its highest levels for 17 years before leaving in 2013. He has been an outspoken critic ever since, speaking around the country about the dangers of destructive cults and has appeared on numerous podcasts, radio, and TV, including Leah Remini's Scientology and The Aftermath, which I've seen, awesome show. Chris also works to promote critical thinking, skepticism, and reason, and I have watched some of the, his uh, videos, and they're awesome. And can I also ask you to help me congratulate Chris, because one of the conversations, I have to tell them what happened. <laughs> So I was, we, Chris and I were communicating back and forth and about his talk and when he was coming out and the subject matter. And it turns out on his honeymoon at the top of the stratosphere is when he, we had one of these conversations. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> he just got married a month ago. So, but we were important enough to get a conversation during his honeymoon. So please help me in welcoming Chris Shelton. <laughs> You know, I, I love talking to humanists because humanist is actually the only label that I've actually been proud to have uh, in the last five years since coming out of Scientology. And um, that's, yeah. Yeah. So, so that's pretty cool. So thank you very much for inviting me down here. And I've got a, a little prepared script here, so I'm just going to read from my computer. But um, this is really great. I always enjoy opportunities to educate and inform people. And, and, uh, and in some ways, I guess, uh, warn, you know, because there's, uh, you know, there's pitfalls in life. And I think that, you know, Scientology as a subject is fascinating. I'm sure you guys have tons of questions. I'll be happy to answer them. Um, but for me, it's representative of a bigger thing, which is that we are all somewhat susceptible to, you know, cons, um, manipulation, and indoctrination. And that's why I put this talk together the way that I have. So, um, you know, we like to think of ourselves uh, often as smart, educated, worldly, experienced. Uh, and maybe some of us might think that, but um, I don't think anybody thinks they're a stupid idiot. Uh, and for the most part, we're right. People in general are not 
stupid idiots, but they do stupid things. And uh, our reasoning is sometimes flawed. You know, uh, we're raised with explicit and implicit biases, which affect how we view things. And if that wasn't bad enough, we also have these crazy things called emotions. And those all by themselves can make us act a little nuts. Uh, and these are some of the reasons that we have a hard time making fully objective and evidence-based decisions. <laughs> so, okay, let me talk a little bit about my background here before we get into this anymore. And let me see if I'm using this right. There we go, okay. So I've been out of Scientology for five years now, since the end of 2013. And I've been an outspoken critic of it ever since. I had a very, very short window of silence. Uh, most people, you know, they come out of groups like this and they uh, disappear. They, they want to figure out what happened to them. They, you know, they kind of retreat for a while. I talk. I just do that a lot. So I, I kind of couldn't help myself and I started speaking out pretty quickly. Um, now, as far as why I'm a critic, the you know, there are a lot of reasons why, uh, not the least of which is that they caused me a lot of personal harm and also that it harmed people that I loved and people that I knew. And I've actually gotten over most of the anger of that, you know, over the last five years. Um, and I never wanted to start speaking out in an angry, hateful, emotional way. Um, I, didn't, I didn't put this into my talk, but I'll just tell you guys that I was very, very fortunate coming out of Scientology uh, because when I came out very early on, I ran into Carl Sagan. And my only experience with Carl Sagan pre Scientology had been Cosmos, you know, billions and billions of stars, right? That's all I knew about Carl Sagan. And uh, so when I found skepticism, skeptics.com, Michael Shermer, Penn and Teller, James Randi, I ran right into this stuff because I wanted to find, I didn't want to go from one cult to another. I was determined to not do that. And so I wanted to find out what, you know, what happened to me and how did this occur. And that's when I ran into those things. And so the demon haunted world was, you know, it became kind of, for lack of a better word, biblical for me, you know. And I didn't, because it was not going from one cult to another, it was going from a cult to no, this is how you know you can actually keep yourself from getting into destructive mindsets. So, got over most of the anger. I don't really have an axe to grind at this point. It's not personal for me. Um, you know, in fact, in many ways, I hope someday to see and, and meet back up with and reconnect with many of the Scientologists that I knew. Uh, I don't bear them animosity or anything. I think I can think of them. I, I, on one hand, I can count the number of people I still have any anger towards at all. And I just wanted to make that clear because my motivation on this is kind of important. And of course, Scientology is going to say, I've got an ax to grind, I'm a horrible, awful person, and that sort of thing. And eh, not, not really. So when I started speaking out, I realized that having a blog and posting written articles was good, but making videos was even better because you reach a hell of a lot more people. Uh, and it's a pretty audiovisual world these days. And, uh, and I started a weekly YouTube Q&A show where I answer people's questions that they pose about Scientology, and sometimes that's expanded out into other subjects as well. And one of the themes that I return to again and again is how people get wrangled into destructive cults in the first place. With its crazy beliefs and its human rights abuses posted all over the internet, why would anyone in their right mind let themselves be associated with Scientology? And that's just one of thousands of destructive cults that are out there. There's estimated to be about 5,000. They're not even all religious-based. There are political cults. There are sport cults. Uh, it's not uncommon to hear about uh, martial arts cults in the world of martial arts. Right? It's usually not much of a surprise in martial arts publications to hear about some sensei who's got an authoritarian complex and he's become a little Hitler to his students and, you know, karate kid, you know? So uh, that happens, you know, that's a thing. So, okay, let's focus on Scientology because uh, it's 
basically such an obvious, simple, and easy example to use. Uh, I sort of amuse myself a little bit when people ask me about it in real life because almost one for one, here's how the conversation goes. Oh, you were a Scientologist. Wow, what, what is Scientology? Well, it's a money-making scam designed <laughs> to enrich one man which uses religious cloaking to hide its true nature and give its leaders protection from the IRS so it can continue to scam people and so its victims will have no recourse in a court of law. And they say, well, sure, okay, but what's Scientology? <laughs> and I go, no, it's what I just told you. That is Scientology. And they go, yeah, but what do they believe? What do they tell people? And I go, oh, you want to know what they believe. You, you want to know what the scam is. Okay, all right, well, that's a whole different thing. That's, that's the window dressing, see? So we can then, and let's, okay, good, so let's talk about that. Now, you know, I'm not trying to be a jerk when I do that, right? Uh, I'm actually just trying to be very precise in answering the question. And it's important because I want people to make, I want it to be clear right up front that it's a scam and it's nothing else but a scam. Uh, yeah, my man. So if you think it's something different than that, or if you start granting it some legitimacy, you start listening to some of the pseudoscience and metaphysical prattle that this guy put together, and you can start falling for it. And you can start giving it some legitimacy that it doesn't deserve. Scientology is a con. Now, all the metaphysical garbage that they throw at you in Scientology is not true. Because if the con were real, and Hubbard's explanations of the metaphysical world were accurate, then there would be some kind of tangible results from Scientology. And I'm not talking about making people feel a little bit better or experience less emotional stress when they think about their mom. That's an amazingly easy thing to do. That's an easy result to produce. And there's many methods in psychology and psychiatry, with drugs, with entertainment, with meditation, there's all sorts of things which work on people, or a lot of people, that will help make them feel better. If the goal is to feel better, that's easy. But let's be clear, none of those things necessarily cure anything or make someone's worries go away permanently. These things provide some relief at best and some distraction at worst. Hubbard made much bigger promises than that about Scientology. Things like curing physical ailments, giving people perfect eyesight and eidetic memory, getting them to be able to think faster than computers, and be in such a state of being that they never again suffer from psychosomatic illnesses. I'm not engaging in hyperbole when I say that Hubbard promised the moon and the stars to his followers, but actually never really got off the ground. So let's look at how Dianetics and Scientology explain themselves so you can see how very intelligent people could fall for this. According to Scientology's website, they describe Scientology like this. Quote, developed by L. Ron Hubbard, Scientology is a religion that offers a precise path leading to a complete and certain understanding of one's true spiritual nature and one's relationship to self, family, groups, mankind, all life forms, the material universe, the spiritual universe, and the supreme being. They don't think small. Scientology addresses the spirit, not the body or mind, and believes that man is far more than a product of his environment or his genes. Scientology comprises a body of knowledge which extends from certain fundamental truths. Prime among these are man is an immortal spiritual being, his experience extends well beyond a single lifetime. His capabilities are unlimited, even if not presently realized. Scientology further holds man to be basically good, and that his spiritual salvation depends upon himself, his fellows, and his attainment of brotherhood with the universe. Scientology is not a dogmatic religion in which one is asked to accept anything on faith alone. Yeah, okay, that's 
totally not true. But <laughs> on the contrary, one discovers for oneself that the principles of Scientology are true by applying its principles and observing or experiencing the results. That line, by the way, is crucial to how Scientology works. The ultimate goal of Scientology is true spiritual enlightenment for, uh, oh, and freedom for all. Okay, now from that description, you get to read all that and you go, wow. You get a sort of generalized view of Scientology. It's kind of, a, this is how I've characterized it, as kind of a McDonald's or a Burger King of spiritual enlightenment. <laughs> you know, one size fits all. You can have it your way, and we're not going to shove anything down your throat. And it's that kind of pleasant language which appeals to a certain percentage of the population and gets them thinking that maybe there's something to Scientology after all. Now, the, and believe me, this language has been gone over and over and over. This is, you know, 80, 60 years of development to come up with the best way to communicate this so that it will appeal to the broadest set of people. Now, the truth is that most of the people who ever had anything to do with Scientology got involved with it many years ago or are the kids of longtime Scientologists. Scientology has not been successfully proselytizing for about a decade now, and their membership is, shrink is shrinking pretty fast. Yeah. Since the word got out about them over the internet, and especially, now this is, here, this is a real thing, because um, it's been a gradual progression. You know, you guys have probably heard about it for the most part over the last couple of years, but this has been something that's been being protested and worked on for decades. And especially when the hacktivist group Anonymous hit the cybersphere in 2008 with widespread international exposure of the corruption and human rights abuses that go on at the top of Scientology's highest levels, it's been very difficult for Scientology to overcome the stigma attached to their name. After the Anonymous demonstrations, because it was more than just some postings on the internet or a few blog posts, Anonymous came out in those Guy Fox masks, and they were world, they were international, London, Los Angeles, here. Every, you know, everywhere there was a Scientology church, they were out in numbers, and they were protesting. And it went on for about a year and a half. Uh, I was in the church during that time, and it was, <laughs> it was bedlam. So after the Anonymous demonstrations, more former members started speaking out and started being taken more seriously by the news media. Then the books and documentary, the, the book and the documentary called Going Clear, Scientology and the Prison of Belief, was released in, on HBO in 2014. And finally, Leah Remini's show on A&E called Scientology in the Aftermath, which I was privileged to be on and also act as a consultant for for the first few seasons. That aired last year, and they even won an Emmy. And another season, actually, by the way, is in production right now. And there are other shows on cults now coming out. And he has a show out now called Cults and Extreme Beliefs, uh, which talks about Nexium, Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, Nation of Islam, the Children of God, uh, now known as the Family International. So the Church of Scientology's bumbling PR efforts and outright antagonism towards their critics and the media in general over all of this exposure only made things worse for them and highlighted that they're not just a quirky UFO cult, but are actually dangerous. This was something that people really needed to understand, and now they actually do finally get it. And I'll tell you something else. Scientologists claim that there are millions of members around the world. Okay, I've had the membership lists in my hand. There have never been millions of Scientologists. There's never even been a million Scientologists. <laughs> the actual membership number now, okay, peak, late 70s, 80s, that time <laughs> period, pretty much is when they peaked out. Maybe you can make an argument for late 80s because Dianetics had a bit of a resurgence. 750,000? That's according to their own records, which they're not transparent about. And now we estimate there's probably about 25,000 worldwide. Definitely not more than 40,000. Okay, however, despite the fact that the truth about Scientology is only a Google search away, there are always going to be a certain percentage of the population that fall for this sort of thing. 
I used to think that percentage was small. But the more I studied and learned about critical thinking, psychology, and human nature, the more I realized that actually we're all susceptible to the emotional lures and mental traps that destructive cults like Scientology set for us. And unfortunately, the research is showing that the more intelligent someone is, the more susceptible they are. Why? Well, I'll tell you one big reason right off, and this is important. People don't know the tools of manipulation and salesmanship. So they fall for tricks and traps that they simply have no idea are being laid for them. Smart people might be really smart in one area or even a few areas, but unless they're smart in this area of psychological manipulation and undue influence, they're likely to be tricked into accepting or agreeing with things that are actually not good for them or are not what they are actually represented to be. This is why critical thinking is so important. And it's actually one of the main reasons why I identify myself when I talk as critical thinker at large and not ex-Scientologist at large. Yeah. It's critical thinking, man. That's where it's at. So emotional manipulation is perhaps, yeah, I don't know if I'd even qualify this. It, it is one of the most powerful forces in human history. Appeal to emotion can be a powerful motivator, and for many people, an easy manipulator. It's not that we should all become like Mr. Spock, right? Emotions are not inherently bad or wrong. It's that emotions can be appealed to very easily and swayed in one direction or another without the use of reason. Aww. Right? <laughs> Show most people a picture of a cat or a little kid and you're instantly more popular than if you were to show pictures of war atrocities, which I'm not going to show right now because I don't want you to hate me. <laughs> Positive emotional impact changes hearts and minds all by itself. I mean, political people, like, this is what they live and, and breathe with. Joaquin Kruger wrote in Psychology Today, quote, emotions can be powerful experiences, but they usually do not last long. They sometimes make us do things we later regret. Today, we're angry at a colleague and want to yell at her. Tomorrow, we wish we'd acted more rationally, no matter how compelling our desire was at the time. By transforming goals and desires in the heat of the moment, emotions can lead us to make choices that hurt our long-term interests. Doing something that you do not want to do is one of the hallmarks of irrationality. Hence, Emotions make us irrational, end quote. Studies I've read indicate that intelligence and rationality are not the same thing. And that just because someone knows a lot of things is no guarantee they won't fall for the same irrational arguments that less intelligent people do. In fact, they may be even more susceptible because a higher intelligence gives you a false sense of security. Look at the educated doctors who should know better, who are pushing pseudoscientific nonsense on TV, or uttering some of the most inane crap ever about matters outside their medical expertise. It comes as a big no more than we really do. Just because we may know about logical fallacies or reason is no safeguard that we won't fall for the same tricks everyone else does. We often have an inflated sense of not just our intelligence, but also how gullible we can be but research is not on our side about this. And so we come to Scientology and how it can snare the unsuspecting, the gullible, and those who have emotional issues that are just looking for some help. Scientology's recruitment process depends greatly on two logical fallacies which many people easily fall for, appeal to emotion and appeal to authority. Appeal to emotion simply means that rather than use facts or evidence to convince someone, they're instead told that if something feels good or feels right, well, it must be true. There are lots of variations of this, including the opposite, where if something makes you fearful, 
or produces almost any kind of emotional response, well, see, it produced that response. There's something there. Must be something valid about this. Must be something true. People go, well, I feel this way, so yeah. Now, appeal to authority is when you take someone's word or testimonial as true or probably true because you've been convinced that their statements should be true based on their knowledge, education, background, or experience. There are plenty of examples where it's not necessarily wrong to do this, but there are plenty more examples where it can be a disaster to blindly accept anyone's word as law. So, this is the Church of Scientology in Las Vegas. Here's what happens when someone comes into a Church of Scientology to find out what it's all about. Most of the conversation revolves around you. Who you are, what your background is, what you do for a living, that sort of thing. Not only are they getting information about you, but they're also prospecting you to see whether you're going to be a paying customer or not. If you're broke, out of a job, have some kind of obvious mental problems, they want to show you the door as quickly as possible. <laughs> You're not going to find anyone in Scientology interested in you if you can't pay for books or services. Remember what I said at the beginning. It's a con. Something else they will also often do before getting into this too far is ask you what you may have heard or know about Scientology. The idea is to find out if you have any preconceived notions, internet information, or have encountered anything negative about it. What? Yeah. Right? Some people haven't, but obviously at this point, most people have. They want to do what they can to chill any reservations you might have and convince you that what you've heard about Scientology isn't true. So. Think about this, get this picture here. Here you are standing in this very nice upscale building with people smiling at you and talking in a very friendly way and who appear extremely sympathetic. Also, the people who they have out front usually know what they're doing. They're very warm and inviting and they always put their best looking people out on the front lines to attract new members. And that has a subconscious response with most people. You may have read that there is physical abuse in Scientology, but these people who are standing in front of you have no bruises or scars, and no one's beaten anybody up, and everyone seems very happy. It's easy to shrug off anything you may have seen or heard on the internet when these very confident and attractive people look at you and say, I've never heard anything about space aliens. Or, eh, you know, people say anything on the internet. You know, haters are going to hate. The reason they can tell you that with a straight face is because usually they're telling the truth as they see it. Most lower level staff members in Scientology have never heard of Xenu or the more fantastic science fiction stuff because that information is kept confidential and is reserved for the highest levels of Scientology which only about 1% of Scientologists ever get to. It costs about $500,000 and many years in Scientology, years before you're going to get to the Xenu story. This is, that stuff is not day one material. So you may have watched it on South Park, but believe me, most Scientologists haven't, and they won't. There's a thing called information control, and it's crucial to the model of a destructive cult, and Scientology is absolutely brilliant at it. And to be frank, most of the abuses and human trafficking and that sort of thing that goes on is at the upper levels of Scientology, in a group called the C Organization, S-E-A, C Organization, and not what happens at the local level churches like the one here in Phoenix. So on the front lines, when they tell you that they haven't seen or heard of the stuff you read on the internet, they're usually telling you what they think is the truth. That doesn't make it the truth. I'm just saying that's what they think it is. I know better because I worked as one of those staff members and then I also worked at the upper levels in the C organization and I was physically and mentally abused. The stories are real and that everything you've heard, that stuff does happen. 
All right. So anyway, they usually want to do what they call a personality test. Remember what I said about the appeal to authority? Well, it starts right at the beginning because they actually call these the Oxford Capacity Analysis. Now, it's never had anything to do with Oxford or England. Okay, this whole thing is wholly American. Uh, seriously, this test has been around almost in the same form since the, early, since the 1950s. And they keep calling it this because Americans have this weird respect for everything British. <laughs> now, I'm not offending, I don't want to offend any Brits, but just because something comes from England does not make it legit. Now, the OCA is one of the primary means that Scientology uses to sucker people in to take services. It consists of 200 pretty odd questions, which they score in order to graph your personality and tell you about yourself. There are questions like, do you sleep well? Do you spend much time on needless worries? Do you browse railway timetables, dictionaries, and such for fun? <laughs> Some of these questions are a little out of date, right? The graph, okay, and then they have, that's the graph that you get, okay? The graph has lines to measure your happiness, responsibility level, communication, and other personality traits. And it goes from 100 at the top to minus 100 at the bottom and you get you know, the scale there, and they have all these little uh, dotted lines and dashed lines and various things, and it's all looking very scientific. <coughs> Believe me, it's not. I did an entire video on how they made this thing, and it was, it was wow. All right, so then they sit you down, and one-on-one, -on -one, they go over the results with you. And it's basically one step up from a cold reading. It's you know, it's what psychics do, right? They, it's like a warm reading, because you have been talking. And uh, you've given them some of the information about yourself, and they go over the results with you, and during that process, they get you to tell them even more about yourself. The whole point of this entire thing is to get you to open up and tell them what it is about yourself that you want to change or improve. Now, you are already there in person. They will never do this with you online. If you, they'll, they'll let you take the test online, but the evaluation has to be in person. You're invested. You've arrived. You're physically there. You've taken the time, right? You walked in. You want to know more about yourself. You've, taken two, you've answered 200 of the stupidest questions in the world. So you have some motivation to, to talk. Mm. And people almost universally start talking. What the Scientologists want is the thing that you want to change or improve about yourself. If I asked you right now, what's the one thing about yourself that you really don't like and would like to change? The answer, whatever it is, would what Scientology would be calling your ruin. Okay, that's the term they use. It's ruin finding. Very few people do not have an answer to that question. Most everybody has something. I, in fact, I've never met anyone who's totally satisfied with everything that they have going on. I mean, we're human. This is life. Everyone's aware of their own securities, uncertainties, fears, and Scientology knows that. Now, the magic moment tends to be right there. They get you to tell them what your ruin is, or they guess at it until it's, they get something that you will agree with. And then they spring this on you. Scientology can handle that for you. Here you are. You've been going along for years, maybe your entire life, with this ruin. And you've known about it. Maybe you've talked about it, maybe you've kept it secret, but it's been there this whole time. And you haven't had any real idea how to resolve it, because if you did, you would have resolved it a long time ago, right? Now, here's somebody literally saying, I've got the solution for you. Now, if they have done their work right, they've got you in an emotionally vulnerable moment where you have established a rapport and you trust this person who's doing this evaluation for you. 
Those are the appeals to emotion and authority that they're trying to establish so you'll accept that what they're saying is true. What they're trying to sell you at that point is a course or counseling sessions. And they'll say that this course that they're going to offer you, and they have a whole array of classes at the lower levels. Time management, relationship troubles, communications class, problems with work, children, the full range is covered. They have definitely done their work when they have, and when it comes to surveying the broad public as to what their common ruins that people have are, and here's something that will deal with that ruin for you. All right. Now, most of what they call these basic or first level services actually are pretty much just based on common sense principles that have been reworked in such a way that it sounds like, Hubbard was really good at this, that it sounds like some big revolutionary concept. Uh, Hubbard was always making things sound like he was the only one who could figure things out. And he'd done years of research and all of his discoveries worked whereas no one else's did. And this is also part of the indoctrination in Scientology. They work hard from the very beginning to get you in a frame of mind where you think that Scientology is original and new and has never been seen before, that it's all the work of this one genius man, and that anyone who's against it is only criticizing it because they don't want you to get better. Yeah, I'm a, I want all of you to fail, <laughs> miserably. <laughs> all right. It works for Tom Cruise, works for John Travolta, so it's going to work for you. You sign up for one of these basic services, and it's like 50 bucks, 100 bucks. And you think it's a total deal because you're going to finally get rid of this thing that's been causing you all this stress and emotional upset and worry for however long it's been going on. And you go in and you do the class, maybe it takes about 15 hours or so of study, 20 hours, or you do some introductory counseling sessions where somebody directs your attention to the obvious points of stress and upset in your life and gets you to open up and talk about it. And that alone is therapeutic. But you think because somebody's finally doing it in a Scientology environment and there's all this indoctrination going on that it's something special because it's Scientology, you see. Like I said, there's so many subtle manipulators, I could talk about them all day long, I swear. Uh, but basically everything hinges on the fact that you're invested in the service and you want it to work. If you go in there, now this is also important, if you go in there all huffy and puffy and challenging everything and telling them that you don't think it's going to work, they're going to sit you down and they're going to try to change your attitude. They don't want any doubting Thomases in there. In fact, they have a name for that. You're a potential trouble source. And you either need to get with the program or they'll show you the door. They do it a lot more gently than that most of the time, but basically that's what it comes down to. So there's a filtering system there, you see. If you come out on the other side and you feel all better about anything, anything at all that you studied, or what came up in your counseling, they reinforce through lots of positive suggestion, and there's social dynamics at play there, there's peer pressure at play, as well as your own personal investment. All of these things come together and they, they get across to you and they reinforce that it was Scientology that helped you and you should do more of it. All right, <laughs> slowly you start learning that there's a whole series of services that they want you to do, one after another. Every one of those boxes leading every level of that chart is a service. On the left side is courses, on the right side is counseling services. Okay, and each one of those boxes is not a five hour service. Some of those boxes represent two years, three years worth of service. Okay, that's called the bridge to total freedom. Yeah, and it's not free, but it'll get you freedom. Okay, so. You get this whole, they're, they're going to get you this pretty soon. You're going to do that first service, maybe another service, then they're going to introduce you to this monstrosity. And what this is supposed to represent 
is a, a series of services which are supposed to lead to this incredibly new, this incredible new plateau of spiritual and mental freedom and understanding. One service follows the next and the next, each one of them progressively more expensive, by the way, uh, but supposedly also more and more powerful as you go. And generally speaking, as you go up the line, the services take longer. There's a level up near the top called OT7. I have known Scientologists who have been on that one service for 10 years. Pain the entire time. Every six months, they have to report to Clearwater, Florida and pay a few thousand dollars for a, a refresher, they call it. Uh, okay, now there's subtleties and there's a lot of other things that can enter into this, right? I'm very much giving a very simplified version of all of this stuff. Not everyone falls for their pitch, and not everyone goes in there willing to tell the test evaluators what's going on with them. Uh, for example, when you read it from journalists about how they go into the big, scary Scientology church, and they take a personality test, and they sat there, and they had it evaluated so someone could sell them a book, those reporters were not emotionally invested. They didn't actually do the process that I'm describing to you, and so when they report on it, it's sort of this kooky, weird thing, and, you, and when you're outside of it, an objective, you can see that it's this kind of kooky, weird thing, but it's not that way for the people who are actually doing it. Um, now, I'm not criticizing the journalists. I'm just saying that because they're not there to be convinced, and they already pretty much know what's going on, their stories are already pretty much pre-written. Um, yeah, and it, for people who do that, it doesn't matter how smart they are, what their background is, how many degrees they have. When you're invested, their emotional, psychological commitment to the process and the desire to change allows Scientology to sell Scientology. In my case, my family had been involved with it my entire, almost my entire life. My parents got involved when I was about four years old. I didn't go into the church with my hackles up and fearful that they're going to, you know, what they're going to find out. I went in knowing that my parents, who I love very much and respect, had been helped by this group, and so I was open to the possibility that they could help me. And I did that when I was 15 years old, by the way. I was an easy mark, and they nailed me in less than an hour, and they had me practically begging to sign up. <laughs> I was 15 years old, I was a sophomore in high school, and I could not believe that this beautiful blonde woman was telling me all these things about myself, like, how did you know I was so shy? How did you know I couldn't get a date with girls? What? I, I, how do you know I have problems with this? That's crazy. I mean, it's written all over my face, right? 15 year old high school kid. All right, now hindsight bias <laughs> is also a wonderful thing because it allows us to look back on our past mistakes with the benefit of the knowledge that we now have. We feel we should have known better back then because we know better now. I can easily see where I went wrong. I can see how I was conned and how they suckered me in using my own fears and insecurities against me. And they didn't really have to try very hard. But I don't look back on that with a lot of regret now or think that I was a complete victim because I can also see how I helped them con me. And, yeah. You know, they didn't have to, they didn't force me to write my name on the, on the dotted line, you know. And that's how I think we all get fooled in the end. We don't just let it happen, but we actually help make it happen. We use our intelligence and our emotional needs and desires to dream up reasons why we should do something, rather than stop and question and reason out what's actually going on. It doesn't take much to do this, just a few reminders to ourselves to not go so fast, not be in such a hurry to jump at what's probably too good to be true. If we were to be just slightly more active thinkers and use a little more critical thinking, these con artists and destructive cults would never gain any momentum. And, you know, I talked about all these little subtle tricks. Now, now, now is one of them. Don't go home and think about this. You don't want to do that. You want to do this now, right now. Now is the time to make a change. 
Because they know if you walk out the door, 90% of you aren't walking back in. That's how the con of Scientology works at its lower levels. There's a whole lot more going on as you progress further, which I've not particularly addressed today. I mean, Scientology is a huge subject. Um, I actually ended up writing a whole book about it. Now, I, I don't have copies of the book here with me today. We had some logistics issues with that. So I'm just going to shamelessly self-promote myself right now and say go on Amazon and buy my book. It's called Scientology A to Zenu, An Insider's Guide to What Scientology is Really All About. And I did not write a memoir. My book is a critical analysis of the subject. So if you really want to know what is it, what's the belief system, who is L. Ron Hubbard and how did he pull it off, was he a con man, did he really believe, actually the answer is kind of in the middle, it's not a black and white thing, <coughs> what are all those confidential levels, because there's a hell of a lot more than just Zenu, a lot more. People have a, in the big wide world, people have a very overinflated idea of how important Xenu is in the Scientology cosmology. And Scientologists actually believe at the higher levels that what they're doing is saving the world. By, by doing Scientology, they actually believe that that process of doing Scientology is helping you and you and you and you personally. It's kind of, it's very magical thinking. But there's a whole belief system there. I lay all of that out. I explain all of it. And the last parts of the book are a couple chapters on uh, recovery from that topic. Because I've been doing this all on my own. I mean, I, you know, I have had a little bit of counseling, but it's been a lot of critical thinking, a lot of education, a lot of looking and talking and, and, and feedback with other people and stuff like that. And it's been an amazingly wonderful process. The last five years have, have been definitely the best years of my life, because uh, the years prior to that were not. So, all right, so that's basically my talk on why smart people fall for stupid things. I hope you guys got something out of that, and I am more than happy to take any questions that you have. Um, thank you for coming out and speaking to us, yeah. and as I told you before, I'm a huge fan. Um, I was wondering if you could tell me, um, what are the managerial style differences between Miscavige and LRH? Both have a history of using um, emotional abuse, physical abuse, although in Hubbard's case it was domestic violence. So where, what are the actual differences between the two? Okay, um, L. Ron Hubbard in the last in the end years of his life, I'd, I'd say basically in the 1960s or so is when I can say definitively, like absolutely, I can point to evidence that he became a true believer in his subject. And he, he, he was auditing himself as the counseling services. It's, it's not really analogous to counseling. It's a bit of a misnomer, but it's the only word I can use to describe the process. Hubbard was doing that, those procedures on himself every day. And you wouldn't do that if you were just conning people. So I think there was something, I think he really believed in the subject. Um, and he was a little, he was kind of schizo a little bit. I mean, I'm not, not, I'm not being clinically. I mean, it's just some days he would be all about helping people, and other days he'd all be all about destroying people. He was an odd bird. He had his own little navy called the Sea Organization, literally on boats, sailing around the Mediterranean and Spain and Portugal. Uh, he was hiding from the law. Then they land in Clearwater in the 1970s, and then he goes into hiding because they had an FBI raid, and that was a big deal, and then they found out that they were trying to infiltrate the government. I mean, it was, it was, there was a lot going on. So Hubbard's last years, and then he also was, you know, fighting some senility and uh, some physical problems. He had two strokes. So, um, so he was not as physically abusive of a person, and in fact, I, don't, I can't think of any instances where he personally beat somebody. Uh, he implemented disciplinary actions that were extremely abusive, uh, throwing people over the, overboard off the side of the boats as a disciplinary action, calling it overboarding. Um, that was a thing. Locking people up in the chain locker. The chain locker is the part of the ship at the front where the chains are wrapped up for the anchors. Well, that little locker room is not a pleasant place to be, especially when the chains are going up and down. 
And there's a story, and I believe it's true, that he locked a four-year-old in one of those, oh, in one of those places one time, right, for a couple days. Because the kid had, had, uh, messed, had messed up somebody's book or had, had stolen something. So Hubbard could be this like Captain Bly level disciplinarian, and then the, and then the next day cares about the crew, wants them to be doing better, buys new uniforms for everybody. So it was very it was a very odd dynamic with him. Um, but he was the source of Dynamics and Scientology. He was the man, and he wrote thousands of bulletins and. 25 or 30 books. He gave like 4,000 plus lectures. So people revered L. Ron Hubbard. They didn't, Scientologists don't worship him. He's not a god to them. But they do revere him and they respect him and they think he's a genius. They can't believe one guy pulled all this amazing stuff off, right? And of course the truth is he didn't. He, he was unapologetic plagiarist. Um, but that was how he, how he did his thing. So, so his disciplinary measures were all in a line with, we got to get the show on the road, we got to keep it on the road, you guys need to get with the program, so I need to do this because you're making me do this sort of thing was kind of the attitude. And in Scientology, personal responsibility is a really big deal. People really believe in Scientology that you are always responsible for your own condition, no matter what. Uh, very much so. so. So that was Hubbard's style. Miscavige came into Scientology. He was second generation like me. He was born in 1960. He was raised by, in a Scientology family. When he was 17 years old, he said, I, I school, screw school, dad. I want to go join the Sea Organization. His dad let him. And he very quickly ended up under, uh, one second, under uh, L. Ron Hubbard directly. Um, Ron Miscavige, Senior, David Miscavige's dad, is now out of Scientology. He wrote a whole book about this. Uh, David Miscavige hates the fact that his dad is out. There are more hate websites about his dad than there are anybody else. Me, Leah Remini, anybody. Uh, just get zoogles of them. And, um, and Miscavige may have been a true believer when he was young, but he's not now. There's no evidence that he had believes in the principles and tenets of Scientology now. And I think he's just kind of running it because you know it, it satisfies a craving for power and authority that he has. And it's not the money, it's the power. There are people who have a thing about that, and he's one of them. And he has used, he's personally beat up people. I know them. I mean, I'm, I'm friends with some of them. Um, he uh, has also engaged in reigns of terror. There's a thing called the hole that existed for a while. In San Jacinto, California, there's a there's an international base for Scientology, and he had people locked up in a double wide trailer for months at a time, in in group, right? And and this was a this was a group punishment activity that went on for actually probably years. Um, we believe that that is not the case now, but you know you can't really tell. It's not like Miscavige is going to change his colors or or feathers or something. He's he is what he is. So that's. That's, I, I don't know if that totally answers it, yeah. but that's, okay. Yeah. Wasn't he one of the messengers aboard the Free Winds? <laughs> no, uh, well, yes, he was a messenger. Uh, the Free Winds was, came later. Um, there are a number of boats Scientology has owned over the years. And when Hubbard was sailing around in the, in the Mediterranean, they had about four, three or four of these boats. All of those have now been sold off. The Scientology now owns a little mini cruise ship called the Free Winds. And that sails around down in Aruba, Curacao, that area, mostly. And um, L. Ron Hubbard um, gathered around himself the children of Scientologists who were on those boats back in the, this is in the late 60s and early 70s. And he used them as couriers and messengers. And they, as they grew, they became more and more responsible for more and more as they were relaying Hubbard's orders and directions around the boats. When they went to land in, in the mid-70s, those messengers had more status, and they would literally stand watches, like, I think it was 24 hours, uh, where uh, they would be servicing L. Ron Hubbard personally and directly. And I mean very personally and very directly, changing his clothes, making sure his cigarettes were out, bathing him. I mean, it was, it's amazing but I believe it's true that he was not a pedophile. OK? 
Okay, there's no evidence that he ever did anything with these kids of a sexual nature. That's surprisingly something Scientology is not guilty of. But a lot of physical abuse and a lot of mental and, and psychological abuse they are very, very guilty of. But these kids were literally, Hubbard became a new father figure for them. And that was what David Miscavige came into uh, in the 70s and how he came up to become the leader of Scientology. He got right into the most inner of inner circles in Scientology. Okay, we're back here. And if you do have a yep. question, raise your hand because I want, if, if you talk without the microphone, we can't get, get it on the video. So wait for me, please. Good. Uh, hey, thanks for a very informative about Scientology. I always wondered what was going on there. Well, you certainly give us some insight. Right. But I do have a question, and this deals more with cults in general, not with Scientology. What would you say the key difference is between a cult and a state? And a, and a state? A state, a, a nation state. Oh, well, okay. Uh, there's, there's a number of differences. A, a cult, and, and actually I want to be very, very clear, I use the term destructive cult because cult has so much baggage connected to it. And it's, it's got a long history, it's a very controversial word. But if I narrow it down and I say, look, I'm talking about a destructive cult, now we're, now we're giving it some context. There's um, very, very specific characteristics involved with a destructive cult. Um, it's basically, it's, as I look at it, it's, it's, a, it's an abusive relationship between a leader, leadership, and followers. There's a codependency that occurs because you can't have a leader without followers, you can't have followers without a leader. But there's abuse. There's physical abuse, psychological abuse, emotional abuse, uh, financial abuse, I mean, any level you can imagine. This can come down to a narcissistic relationship, a one-on-one -on -one cult, we call it, or it can be thousands of people involved. And the nature of the relationship is pretty much what establishes the cult status. Uh, some of the characteristics are an inculcation of an us versus them mentality. The group becomes very insular and exclusive. And if you're, if you're not with us, you're against us. And it justifies the means kind of thinking starts coming into play with this because the group starts believing that their way is the only way. It's not a matter of, well, we have some good ideas and we'd like to share them with you. It's we have the truth and we have the only truth. And so we're special, we're exclusive, we're exalted, we're better than you are, right? So these kind of characteristics feed, kind of feed on themselves, and the group becomes more and more insular, more and more isolated. You get, you get situations, you get characteristics like group members don't really want to associate with non-group members after a while. After about a year, maybe two, of being a Scientologist, you look around one day and you realize all your friends are only Scientologists. All your non-Scientology friends have kind of disappeared from your life. Because you kind of got them out of your life. Because suddenly you don't share reality with them. You don't have anything in common with them anymore. You can't talk to them because they're so stupid. They don't know. You know? And you tried to disseminate to them. You tried to tell them, but they wouldn't listen. Well, okay. Yes, you don't get the special sauce. You know? So that, that kind of thing. Uh, yeah. Um, can you briefly tell us what changed your thinking so that you realized it was wrong? And you said the last two chapters of your new book are on recovery. Uh, can you briefly synopsize that? Uh, a little bit. OK. Um, getting out was a long process. Uh, it's, it's a. It's a long series of, of incidents and experiences that I had as a Sea Org member, because it wasn't until I got to the highest levels that I started seeing behind the curtain. And I think it was about 2003 or four when the first really heavy thing happened, where I was involved in a, I was involved in the, the Sea Organization deals with management of Scientology worldwide. C organization also delivers those upper level OT levels that only the C org does it. You can't go to the Phoenix org and get that. They call them orgs, by the way, not churches. Organizations, orgs, orgs. They're not churches, they're orgs. 
Uh, so the Phoenix org only goes to the level of clear. You, you got to go to LA or Clearwater to get those upper level services. That's all Sea Org. So that's the group that I was working in. And I found that the bureaucracy was more interested in the bureaucracy than it was in actually the mission of what we were doing. That's the, that there was something that happened that sort of, oh, we're, we're really not doing what we're saying we're doing. We're doing something else. And I, it would take me too long to explain the whole thing, but that was the first eye-opening experience. Then I had more and more, and I started seeing very, very gradually over the, uh, as David Miscavige started changing some of the church policies and making them more and more money-centric, very money-centric. Hubbard was all about money, but Hubbard's attitude was, we don't accept money unless we're giving some kind of service. You got to buy a book. You got to do a service. Miscavige became about, no, just give me your money, right? Just straight up. And he started implementing programs that were very, ob very obviously just money-making operations. And I watched this happen. I've been involved in Scientology since the 80s. Uh, so I was watching this kind of morphing going on, and I was like, mm, I don't think I really like this. This isn't really what I, I was about. I've never been, I, I wasn't joining Scientology to get rich. There's nobody in Scientology getting rich except the guy at the top. But I, I, was, I believed in the mission. And then I saw the mission changing, and I saw more and more concentration on money. But I'll tell you the, the, the make break point, the point that, the tipping point for me was one day, I was on a project in Twin Cities, Minnesota. We were opening up the new building in Twin Cities, just like they opened up the new building here in Phoenix. Great big building, renovated, beautiful spaces. And I was contemplating, I was walking down the hall one day, contemplating how I was going to recover some people back into Scientology who had left. And, and I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about how we recruit staff, getting people to join up to work for the organization. And it suddenly dawned on me that I was having to tell people more lies than truth in order to convince them to get on board. And I was always willing to bend the truth a little bit because when you feel that your cause is just and that you're on the side of right, you can justify anything. I mean, we all, everybody does that. And I very much believe that we were on the side of right and that we were here to save the world. So bending the truth a little bit here and there, nah. In Scientology, by the way, there's a, they, they, this is a thing. It's called telling an acceptable truth. That's a thing. Hubbard actually wrote about it. So I was all about acceptable truths. But it hit me all of a sudden, wait a minute, I'm not telling acceptable truths, I'm lying to people. And I never joined up to lie to people. That wasn't what I thought was necessary or, or what was effective. And that was really where it all kind of came together and I was this was 2012, end of, two, this was late 2011. Uh, so I was you know, 41 years old, I'm looking at my life, I'm looking at what's going on, and I'm like, I'm not happy. Everybody around me is happy, I'm able to get them happy, but I'm not happy, and something's wrong here. And I was working insane hours. The Sea Organization is a 24-7 operation. It's not that you go home at six o'clock. The Sea Organization is, is paramilitary. You have uniforms. It's yes sir, no sir. It's uh, ranks, ratings. It's you know room and board. It's dormitory style living. Uh, food's not that great, by the way. And, uh, rice, rice and, and beans. Yeah, it, rice and beans sometimes is a form of punishment. In fact, uh, so that was my life for 17 years. The last 17 years of my life in Scientology was sea organization. So, um, so I knew I was making big sacrifices to do what I was doing. And so to see that it was, you know, lies, mm, you know, and I, I got out of the C organization. Four months later, I went down the internet rabbit hole that I had been denied access to as a C org member. Didn't have internet access as a C org member. So I come out. I'm a curious, talkative guy. And I want to know things. And so I start finding out. And once you start finding things out, it's just, what? What? 
you know, and it's just more and more and more and more and more, and that was what got me out all the way. Okay, um, yeah. we have time for just a couple more, so I got you. Um, yeah, I, you just answered the question I was going to ask, but <laughs> I was in Scientology from the late 70s to the mid-80s, and uh, That's what I, thought. I, I, I guess my question now is, how long do you think it's got to last? I mean, he's got a lot of cash, he's got a lot of property, mm -hmm. but could you have a prediction about, you know, when this whole thing's going to cave in on him? Well, you know, I asked that to somebody uh, recently, um, had a conversation with somebody who was never a Scientologist, who pointed out to me the, um, the McMuggle group. Uh, I'd never heard of them. Apparently, this was a group of about 30 people that got together as a little cult in the 1600s, I think. You can look this up. Uh, the last member of the McMuggles died in, like, 1954. <laughs> So, you know, there's a lot of books, there's a lot of material, it's all over the world, it's translated into every language. I mean, it's, as a subject, I don't think Scientology is ever going to disappear. As an organization, they do have a lot of money. And David Miscavige is in good shape. You know, you see, I think he just turned like 57, 57 or 60 or something. He's not going anywhere. And, uh... And if he, you know, if he dies tomorrow, it's a kind of a coin toss, actually. Maybe the keys to the kingdom don't get passed to somebody else, because Miscavige is very, very ruthlessly dictatorial and paranoid. And he does not share his secrets with anybody. And he gets rid of anybody who looks like they could be a threat to him, because he got in power through a coup. So he knows how that works. So it could be the JW model where a, you know, a group of people, a leadership takes over, could be somebody else steps up. It's almost impossible to predict, but the money is there to keep it going. And the membership model can continue to shrink. They could, if they, the, the thing that we're kind of watching for that I think would be the biggest indicator that things are really collapsing is if they start selling off properties. And we haven't seen that yet, so. Um, in terms of uh, people don't, you know, necessarily think that the, they're meeting the Church of Scientology, but would you uh, speak briefly about the number of businesses and front groups that they create that are actually uh, based on Scientology and do things like Sterling? Yes. Uh, and those people? Absolutely. Scientology has a number of front groups and groups that they call social betterment groups that you would not recognize as Scientology, and they will not tell you it's Scientology, but they will associate themselves with L. Ron Hubbard's name. That's one clue. There is uh, the World Institute of Scientology Enterprises, WISE. Okay, that group is for businesses, Scientology administrative procedures. It's called the Hubbard Administrative System, and they sell this to chiropractors and doctors and anybody who will buy it to run their business using Hubbard's principles. It's a gateway drug to Scientology. Uh, all of these are. There is a social betterment group called the um, Association for Better Living and Education. And under that, you have applied scholastics, which teaches children how to read, handles illiteracy, things like that. They use Hubbard's study methods. Hubbard came up with a whole method of study. And uh, let, me, let me go ahead and finish. And um, that's a front group that they use. And, and Tom Cruise has endorsed one of those groups, the uh, Hollywood. Um, education and Literacy Project, HELP, is something he's backed personally. Um, looks innocuous, looks like it's just teaching kids how to read, and on the surface that is what it's doing. But they use Hubbard's materials exclusively, and again it's a gateway to Scientology, all of these are. Probably their largest front group is a group called Narconon, uh, which is a drug rehab program. Uh, the, the basic theory is it's a detox program. It does not do anything like it says it's doing because the Hubbard's whole theory of detox is so debunked, it is a useless activity to do it. Uh, you know, biologists and, and, and uh, what have spoken out about this. Um, anyway, that's another group, and there are Narconon facilities that are drug rehab facilities, and they're not all called Narconons, so you have to ask when you go into, when we're looking for shopping around for these kind of groups, 
are you connected to Scientology at all? Are you using L. Ron Hubbard's techniques at all? They'll tell you, but not until you ask. Okay, well, our last question. Yes. I was wondering, uh, did uh, or do they have some kind of a health care program or insurance program like other organizations? Nope. When I went to the hospital as a Sea Org member, and I went a couple times when I was in Los Angeles, I was on the dole, public, uh, public assistance. Sea Org members make max $45 a week. That's your pay. Your room is paid for, your food's paid for, your uniform. So you don't have to worry about those things, so it's pocket change, right? This is one of the sacrifices you make as a Sea Org member. So you're not saving money, you don't have bank accounts, you don't have a car, you don't have a house. Uh, you, all that stuff you sell off when you go into the Sea Org. So as a Sea Org member, if we had a, an issue or a problem, most of the time, unless it was extremely serious, like I'm talking stage four cancer, uh, you went to the hospital and you were on the public assistance programs. And Scientology takes full advantage of that completely shamelessly. We didn't know, by the way, when I was in the Sea Org, how much money Scientology actually had. Like, you gotta appreciate the level of information control in that group. Sea Org members don't know anything about what I told you today about the bridge and Xenu and all that stuff. They don't know Scientology has billions of dollars in the bank. They are, they are treated as the, the, the whole attitude within the organization is we never have enough. And the money only flows up. It doesn't flow back down. So if you don't have the money for a new uniform this week or new shoes or a medical procedure, well, we got to make the money because we don't have it because it doesn't exist here, which is true because David Miscavige has all of it <laughs> up at the, at the reserves. So that's, that's how that works. Okay. I'm sure that you all have a lot more questions for Chris, but... We'll save that for coming to lunch with us. But first, let's thank Chris. What a great talk. <laughs> and thank you again. What a great talk. And I hope that you're available to come to lunch with us and have a chance to discuss all this with Chris in person. So thank you. Awesome. Wow, what an amazing event, right? One more round of applause for our speakers, please. Oh, thanks so much. For uh, more shameless plugging. You do have a podcast, right? Yes. Oh yeah. I, okay. I have I, my YouTube channel is my name, Chris Shelton, Critical Thinker at Large. Um, my podcast every week is called the Sensibly Speaking Podcast, and I and I talk about a lot more than Scientology on that podcast. I do three videos a week, a Q&A show on Sundays, a podcast on Saturdays, and a content video on Thursdays, which could be anything. Mostly Scientology related, but I've done lots of other content too. Very cool. And a uh, plug for HSGP would not go amiss. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wink, wink. Uh, we'll talk about it later. Okay. <laughs> if you do like what we do, if you really enjoyed today, we could use your support. If you believe in our mission, please consider donating some money or becoming a member to support us long term. We do have a Patreon account. We, if you go to our website, which is currently experiencing some technical issues unrelated to Church of Scientology, probably, um, we do have a donate button. You can pay us in PayPal. Um, so yeah, well, hopefully we'll see you at lunch. If you could assist us with cleaning up, you know, take out the tablecloths 